Hi. Um, so uh, this is how I learned Haskell by writing tiny games. Um, uh, this is going to be a little bit of a talk about Haskell and a little bit of a talk about learning. Um, and it's probably, I, I would say it's not going to be a comprehensive introduction to anything. I, it, I do not think that I know this well enough to be able to give you a 45 minute talk that will let you go write a program in Haskell immediately after this. Um, but I'm hoping what I will leave you with is sort of some tips on what to look into more, some ways to kind of pick it up more easily when you're starting to get into it and possibly pick up other things more easily too. Um, and just sort of a, a, an introduction to what's kind of exciting and interesting about the language. Um, so I'm Moss, I've already been introduced, so this slide's going to be pretty, pretty quick, not that quick. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's where to find me on Twitter if you want to tell me uh, everything that's wrong with this um, or other things too. <laughs> um, so the uh, basic structure here is I'm just going to give sort of a bit of a context what, what I did, what I'm talking about, uh, and then go through kind of four, four of the games or almost games that uh, I built in the process of doing this. Uh, and then do a little bit of wrap up and potentially have five minutes for questions. We'll, we'll see how close I'm cutting it. But uh, <laughs> uh, um, so first off, uh, what I did. Um, so I, I was trying to learn Haskell. Um, I set myself up a project of writing a series of small roguelike games. Um, it, so is that, if I say the word roguelike, is that something that means anything to some? Okay, so, so roguelike games, uh, they're kind of the uh, VI of computer games. Um, so, so this is rogue, which is uh, you know, the one that all the others are like, uh, and, and the first of them. Uh, and you can see some of the basic stuff going on here. They, they often have these sort of simple ASCII-based graphics. Um, they're generally uh, turn-based, so nothing happens until you actually do something, and then the computer responds, and then the uh, next thing happens. Um, it, most of them um, have what's called procedural level generation. Um, so the levels are randomly generated anew each time you play, so they're sort of a little new and different each time. Um, uh, and uh, death is generally permanent. So if your character dies, you're basically going back from the very beginning and starting over, which is another way they're like the eye. Um, <laughs> and it, it, over time, you sort of, it, it, these have developed into things like NetHack, which sort of builds on Rogue and makes it sort of more exciting and complicated and has color graphics, as you can see in the corner there. Uh, and, and people have sort of built ever more kind of exciting and creative versions of these up to things that are like completely confounding and unplayable. Uh, <laughs> and then the, the sort of last thing I was doing with this um, is, uh, it, come on in. <laughs> and, and so the, the last part of this project was I was going in tiny release cycles. Um, tiny in this case means uh, I spent a week trying to uh, release a new game every day. Uh, sometimes that meant defining game down a lot. Um, sometimes it meant defining new down a little. Uh, and every day in this case is, um, I was actually traveling at a conference out, out in this area actually. Um, it, and I didn't have a whole lot of free time, but I usually had, say, an hour or two to work on stuff. And I was trying to get stuff done, uh, ideally, a few times in, in the course of that hour or two. So, um, so very little release cycles. Um, so, so that's what I was doing. I want to talk a bit about why I was interested in Haskell in the first, case, in the first place. Um, and there's like, there's a lot of reasons to be interested in Haskell. Uh, mine was basically, so, so I've traditionally been very much sort of developing over in the object-oriented world. Um, 
And sort of the two big groups of languages there are your, your more dynamic languages like uh, Ruby or Perl, where y you can write really brief code. So this is, this is some Ruby code that I use to um, sort of review my budget each week. And, and the really nice thing about Ruby is um, that it's, it's concise. I can read it. I can come back to it three years later. And if I actually took care when I was writing it in the first place, then I can pretty quickly see what it was supposed to be doing. Uh, but the downside is um, if I change some code so that like one of the assumptions behind this no longer holds, or if I make a typo somewhere, it, the, the language itself won't give me a lot of feedback until I actually try doing something and it breaks. So I find myself leaning really heavily on my test suite when I'm refactoring Ruby code. Um, in contrast to a more statically typed O language like Java, which um, the, the language gives me a little more help writing things correctly, a, a little. Um, but I mean, look at it. It just takes so many words to say anything. And most of them are so long. And a bunch of them I have to say twice. And so I get kind of tired and my eyes glaze over and like no matter how correct it is I can't actually like make sense of what I was trying to do so so sort of the hope that Haskell was holding out to me when I'd have like conversations with people that were using it was of something that could be both brief like Ruby and correct like Java um, and as I've started getting into it more I, I I found that that's actually played out really well like I, I've also learned other things to find interesting about it, but it's actually, my code is a little more terse in Haskell than it was in Ruby even. And it gives me sort of, the type system actually gives me a lot more help than Java's ever did. So for example, um, one thing to notice here is I didn't actually have to declare any of my types. It's still checking them, but it just recognizes what I'm trying to do and goes on from there. Um, the other thing is, it, I, I don't have to check for null references ever because null isn't a thing I'm allowed to use unless I'm really, really, like, unless I really explicitly say, hey, this is a thing that might not have a value. Look out for that. Um, so it, it, it's sort of even terser than some of the dynamic OO languages I'd used. And it actually, like, the type system feels like it's trying to help and not just trying to make me repeat myself so that I'm sure I really meant it. Um, <laughs> Uh, and finally, uh, I wanted to sort of get into, like, so, so that's what I did. Why, why do that with Haskell? Um, it, it, part of it is just, you know, it's a pure functional language. Um, things that are sort of hard to do in that paradigm are things like input, output, side effects. So doing something interactive like this seemed like a way to dive into the parts that I was unsure about and deal with those right away. Uh, and then the other piece of it is um, my friend uh, Kim Walmark has a slogan that she uh, often uh, reminds people of when programming, work tiny. Um, and I, I think that about sums up the sort of core thing that I liked about this approach. If you do things in little cycles, it makes it a lot easier to learn from what you're doing because you see the effects of things that you try right away rather than a few hours later or a few days later. It also makes it easier to get things done just in general. Um, as I was reminded at the uh, time management talk yesterday, like <laughs> if, you're, if you're working in tiny increments, you can find the time to do a couple of tiny increments whenever. Um, and in that spirit, uh, I'd like to go into the first of the games I developed on, on day one on a plane to a conference with not enough sleep, uh, which I call uh, Insta Permadeath Hack. Um, it's a uh, very, very traditional roguelike game. Um, uh, it's, it's got a procedurally generated map, although it happens on a one by one grid. So I left out most of the procedural generation code because you wouldn't be able to see it anyway. Um, and uh, it's turn based. Unfortunately, you die permanently in the first turn. Um, so, so here's the code for that. Um, for, first off, who like looking at this code, who has some idea of what this is doing? Okay, great. You, you've read some Haskell. Um, 
So there's not a whole lot to say about this. Um, it's uh, uh, basically you start up the program, it prints an at sign, and then it quits. Um, I can actually run that. <laughs> if I remember where I am. There. There's an at sign in front of that uh, prompt. <laughs> Um, what does the app sign mean? <laughs> uh, so, um, it's, it, 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 often in, things, in games like Rogue, the, the at sign is sort of the representation of, sort of you, the character that's running around doing stuff. Um, we'll, see, we'll see more of that at sign later. <laughs> um, it, so, there's not a lot to say about this code, uh, but there is one big point I want to make about it, um, which is, I have this conversation a lot with friends that are sort of interested in Haskell but haven't done a lot of it yet, where they say something like, well, I'm really interested in trying Haskell, but I hear I have to understand monads so that I can do IO. I, and this, this just breaks my heart because like monads are not the easiest concept in the world to understand. You, you may have noticed if you've read a little bit about this before. Um, but, but you also really, like there is a lot that you don't need to understand. So, so this, is, this is actually typed as sort of an, an IO operation. Um, but there is very little you need to know about that to actually get started working on things. So if, if you take no other piece of advice out of this talk, take this. You can learn IO before you learn the IO monad, and you can learn that before you learn monads in general. And in fact, if you have a couple of those concrete examples to, to work with, it'll make it a lot easier to pick up the concept. Um, so. So don't look at that line of code and get scared. Look at that line of code and think, oh, that's printing a character. <laughs> um, so, so the big kind of learning point here is it, it's OK not to solve everything at once. You can give yourself one problem to deal with at a time. In this case, how do I run a program and do anything at all? What is this even? Um, a, and then rather than sort of being lost for a long time, you're doing a little bit and then building on it. Um, so speaking of building on it, um, let's, let's go into the next game, um, which I called something like Wanderer. Um, point of fact, we, uh, I called it I Am That Merry Wanderer of the Night because by God, this liberal arts degree is going to be good for something. Um, <laughs> Uh, and this is a little more advanced than the last one. So there's that at sign again. That's, that's me. I can, I can move around uh, and do stuff as long as that stuff is also moving around. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, so the big, the big like, problems that I was giving myself to solve at this point were um, basically how do I move stuff around? This is stateless. Uh, and also, um, how do I read this thing? Because um, if you're used to languages like Ruby or Perl or Java or Python or Algol or C or Pascal or like most languages in mainstream use, uh, it looks a little different. Um, so I'm not going to tell you everything about how to read Haskell, but here are a few of the basics. Um, so here's a function in Haskell. It's, uh, so this is declaring a parse input function. Uh, it takes a list of characters uh, and it returns a list of commands. Um, uh, so one thing to notice, uh, if I was declaring this in something like Python, I'd have like a def parse input and then I'd have some parentheses around a list of commands. In Haskell, it looks sort of a little more like a statement of a mathematical truth than like a declaration of a procedure for a computer to go through at some point. Um, so, so you've got the sort of equality with things on either side. I, I could actually, it would be a little more idiomatic to do this as a one-liner even. Um, that line break is in there mostly to make it fit on the slide. Um, so that's one of the things that makes it kind of pleasingly concise. Um, and then the other thing to notice is just the function call syntax 
like the function definition syntax is a little different, not in ways that are too big a deal. The main main thing is um, parentheses in some languages mean function application. Parentheses in Haskell basically just mean grouping, just mean do this first before doing the other, other stuff. Um, and then the other piece, if you, if you compare this to the way typing works in something like Java, in Java, I'd have the types sort of intermixed with the uh, declaration of the function itself. Um, in Haskell, there's a separate line where I say, all right, parse input is a function from a list of characters to a list of commands. That's pretty much what that is saying. Um, and then I define it. And as mentioned earlier, I could also leave out that line and it would mean the same thing. Um, so, that is, so that's the minute and a half version of how to read Haskell. Um, the other kind of big discovery of this is lazy evaluation is magic. Um, so uh, this was kind of the point where I really fell in love with uh, Haskell is when I realized that uh, this was the um, sort of main function that I could define for my program. Uh, so this does a few things. First, it reads all of the input that the user is ever going to enter at the keyboard. Um, and then it takes all of that input and translates it, to, translates it into a list of commands. Um, and then it takes the starting state of the game and sort of folds that, uh, folds that list of commands through to a series of successive states for the game to be in. Uh, and then it loops through and um, draws all of them one at a time. Um, so if I tried to do this in Python, I, I'm only picking on Python because it's like one of my favorite languages. But if I tried to do this in Python, uh, basically I would get to this line uh, and then it would hang while it tried to read everything that I typed and eventually I would like give up and break um, and it would loop through and print a bunch of screens for me and it would not be the most helpful thing in the world because playing a game isn't really a batch operation. Um, in Haskell, it says, oh, okay, you're going to want all of the user input at some point. I'll, I'll remember that you want that. And then when you actually do something with it, I'll look it up. Um, and then I convert it to commands. And it says, all right, so you're going to want to turn that list into another list. When, when you do something with that other list, I'll, I'll start translating it. Um, and then I play the game, and it says, all right, you're going to want to take this starting game state and apply these commands to it to make new game states. I'll, I'll do that when you're actually ready to, to do something with those. And then I loop through those game states and it prints them and it says, hey, I need the first game state. Give me the first game state. And it finds the starting one, renders it out to the screen, and then says, all right, I need another game state. And then it sort of waits because to get another game state, it needs me to type something. So then I type a key and it says, oh, OK, here's your next game state. So, so the thing that this means is that I can sort of define everything in the order that it kind of makes sense to me logically. I can say sort of just what are the steps in terms of what I need to do rather than having to structure it in the way that, in the order that the computer will actually need to go through to do it. Um, so the other kind of piece of learning advice I have at this stage, um, it, I would not have gotten nearly this far if at this point I hadn't had a few uh, pair programming sessions with, friend of, with friends of mine. Um, I, I spent a couple of hours working on this with Kim, who I mentioned earlier, I, and she's like done Haskell uh, on and off for a few years. So I could like start working on something and ask her like, hey, how am I even supposed to, I don't have object, what? And she would say, oh, try doing this and this and this. And I'd say, oh. Okay. Oh, it works. Um, and then I also paired with my coworker Matt, who was brand new to Haskell. So, so I'd be working with him on something and he'd say, "What is this? How? What are you doing there?" And then I'd actually have to explain it to him. And it turns out that when you have to explain something to somebody, it's a lot easier to understand it at all yourself. Um, so, ask for help. Pair programming is fantastic. Yes. Um, there are a few sites that I will uh, recommend later on. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
Um, so the uh, third game I started getting into, this is not strictly speaking a roguelike, but it is fantastic. Um, it, this is, uh, I, I spent a few days basically making increasingly complete clones of a game called uh, Robot Finds Kitten uh, by uh, uh, a guy named Leonard Richardson. Um, this shirt is actually fan art from that game. Um, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> and uh, so, um, it, the, in some senses, this is not strictly speaking a roguelike, and uh, arguably not strictly speaking a game, but it is fantastic. So, um, <laughs> uh, so the basic idea is you are a robot. That's this number sign here that's moving around, and there are a lot of objects in the world that are not kitten. <laughs> Um, but you are uh, wandering around looking for the one that is kitten. God, that was well timed. I. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then everybody's happy because kitten. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, kind of the this definitely like was pushing on my sort of comfort level with what I could do in Haskell because it's sort of. It, you know, I, uh, there's even more I/O going on. There's randomness. Like none of these things are really compatible with having a bunch of little pure functions. Um, so a, a lot of the theme of getting this game written for me was uh, learning to isolate the kind of I/O code and the randomness code from the actual logic of of the game, and and that's sort of. I feel like that's an important one to concentrate on if you want to get some, really take advantage of some of the benefits that Haskell has is sort of keep keep most of the IO code, keep most of the code that sort of deals with the outside world where things are mysterious and breakable, um, isolated in a few sort of functions in the outer shell of your program. Uh, and then, um, let let most of the sort of interestingness of your program happen in sort of little pure functions that you can use sort of independently of where the data is coming from and test independently of where the data is coming from. So, so here, like, out in my main loop, I get the user input from the kind of frustratingly named get contents function. Um, and down here, I parse that into a bunch of commands, um, which is not the most interesting function in the world itself, but so be it. Um, the, the other thing this opens up for me is the ability to uh, test things. Uh, is so, it, it, in the first few rounds of this, it was pretty easy to just see that I was making progress because I'd boot up my game and it's like, oh, I can see an at sign on the screen. Oh, when I hit H, it moves me to the left. That's great. Um, but as it got more complex, as it got to the place where you know there are other things on the screen, I don't even necessarily know what they are, it got harder to get that kind of quick feedback on what I was doing and work tiny. Um, so I started falling back more on test-driven development, which is still useful in Haskell, at least if you're me. Um, and in particular, I started using a fabulous tool called DocTest, which is actually borrowed from a Python library of the same name. Uh, the idea with DocTest uh, is uh, Haskell, like a lot of languages, has documentation comments for for functions, where you can sort of give an overview of what a function does and give an example of how to use it. Um, and DocTest uh, looks for code examples like that in, in your documentation. Um, so like when I say double two, it will give me back a four. Uh, and it runs them and says, no, it gives you back a zero. You haven't written anything here yet. <laughs> Um, and so it sort of both gives you some testing and also gives you some confirmation that your documentation is not telling horrible lies to people. Um, and so one other thing to notice here is testing becomes really easy here because there is no outside state that I'm interacting with. Uh, so, so there again, kind of isolating I.O. from everything else is helping me. Uh, and then I can go back and actually give double like a real implementation. Um, it doubles something, and then I run it again, and it says, "Oh, hey, everything's great." Uh, so, I, so I've got my continuous feedback. I've got my ability to see see what's working, what isn't, and that means that, like, 
if I'm doing something wrong, my brain is quickly learning, this is bad, don't do it anymore, rather than sort of getting into the habit of doing it and only learning a few hours later that it was not the right way to do things at all. Um, which brings us to the last of these games. Um, uh, this is um, it, it, this is the one that I'm actually in progress on right now. So you can play it, but it doesn't end really at all. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a game called The Orc and the Pie, uh, based on a D and D adventure by Monty Cook. Uh, it is arguably the world's simplest D and D adventure. Uh, the premise goes something like this: um, You, as an adventurer, are in a ten by ten room. Uh, there's also an orc there, uh, and the orc has a pie and uh, you are hungry for pie. And uh, so things proceed from there in grim and bloody fashion. Um, <laughs> so uh, being an agile nerd, uh, one of the things that I was doing repeatedly in sort of earlier uh, phases of this was I was having a little uh, retrospective after uh, e each of these games that I finished. So I was sort of stepping back saying, hey, what went well? What didn't go so well? What can I try doing differently next time to make this go better? Uh, and one sort of repeated point that had been coming up in the last couple of days as my code got big enough to do anything interesting um, was, I wrote at one point, my design is suffering from having everything in the world tied together. Or, my functions are nice and decomposed, but my data types are a big mess. Um, so I was getting to the point where, um, if I was in an object-oriented language, I would have known exactly what to do next. I would have started breaking things up into little objects and making those little objects talk to each other in little clear ways. But I didn't have objects here, so it was time to start figuring out sort of how you break things down in Haskell and how you get some, like, what, what you do instead of object here. Um, and there's a few things you do. Um, one is just modules. Like, modules are great. Um, so, so one of the big things you get with breaking things into objects is, all right, I've got these two separate responsibilities. I, for example, playing a game versus uh, rendering a game. Um, I want to have a simple, like, I, I don't want to have to change the code for one thing when I'm working on the code, when I'm working on features for the other thing. Um, so modules let you give that kind of nice encapsulated, all right, here's, here's how rendering works. From the outside world, you can see the init screen function, the render function, and the restore settings function, which makes the cursor not disappear um, at your terminal when the game is over. But that's a side note. <laughs> um, and then anything else, like this draw tile function, is just sort of an implementation detail that's hidden inside this module. So now I've got a very clear sort of statement of what my contract is with the outside world. Um, another thing I do with objects is you know, I've got a few pieces of data that are related to each other and sort of travel along with each other a lot of the time. Um, and I, I want to be able to group them together. So uh, for that, uh, record types are a good thing to use. Um, they're a little like a simple object with a bunch of getters. They're a little like a struct. Um, so here's an example of one. It's a game state. Um, it's got a position fo for the player and a position for an orc and a message to show you. Um, and um, when you've declared a record type, you get a constructor for it. Um, there's also a more concise version of that constructor that doesn't name all the fields, but I don't know. Explicit is nice. Um, so here I can say, all right, a new uh, the state of a new game is the players up here, the orcs down here, and the message is, you see a horrible orc. Um, and then uh, it also gives you sort of functions to ask for um, different, different fields in that uh, record. Um, and then there are also some other nifty things you can do, uh, like getting a copy of a record with just one field changed. Uh, there's pattern matching awesomeness that is beyond the scope of 45 minutes, but suffice to say, it's good stuff. Uh, and another thing I do with objects is um, I have something that I might want to do in 10 different ways, or I, I've got a situation where I, I want to do something, but I don't know what it will be. Like, you know, I've read a command from the user input, it's going to change the board somehow, but I don't know what. 
Um, so in OO land, I'd use like a command pattern or a strategy pattern for that. Um, in Haskell, I just use a function for that. They're first class things. I can pass them around. I can have one function take another function. Uh, so for example, um, in, in the orc and pi code, I have a game move function. Uh, I, I have a game move type defined that's just any function that takes one game state and turns it into another game state. Um, so for example, moving an orc to a position gives you a game move from the state where the orc is in one place to the state where the orc is in the other place. There's a move player function that works the same way. There's also quit game, which just goes from anything to the game is over. Um, and do nothing, which goes from anything to itself, which is what happens if I hit any key that isn't um, a known command. Uh, and then the other thing, um, the other thing that I get from object is sort of polymorphism, the ability to uh, sort of write code that can work over different types as long as they present me with the same interface and sort of use them interchangeably. Um, and over in Haskell land, the kind of equivalent for, for that rough equivalent, which is um, sort of limited in some ways compared to object-oriented stuff and also awesome in other ways compared to object-oriented stuff um, is uh, a type class. So, so the way a type class works is I, I've got my rendering engine, for example, for sort of showing output in these games. And I'd love to be able to write it in a way that lets me write new games and just plug this rendering engine into them. Um, so in that rendering code, I declare this roguelike type class that says, all right, as long as this data type, I, 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 as long as this data type for a game state gives me a way to view a message out of it and a way to view sort of all the tiles that I should draw on the screen for it, um, it, I can use this code that renders roguelike game states interchangeably with any of them. Um, it's, it's very like a Java interface. If uh, like that that metaphor um, will take you along, it will take you long enough to discover what's frustrating about the difference, um, and um, so it sort of lets you get some of that same polymorphism happiness that you can have in object-oriented programming. Um, and so all of this was because I sort of hit that point where I was saying, hey, my code's getting big and complicated. What do I do to break this up in a functional language and be able to sort of work in smaller pieces? Uh, and, and so the, the other big kind of learning point here is stop and reflect regularly. So every, every day or so, or more often than that, take a moment to step back, say, hey, what's, what's working well for me? What isn't so wor working so well for me? Where am I finding myself really frustrated? What, what have I learned that's made me happy and that I want to do more of? And sort of pick something to try doing differently for a little bit and see how it works out. Um, so those are my four games. Um, a question had come up earlier. You'd, you'd asked about sort of places to go for more help with this stuff. Um, I, I will try to find more resources and put them on the session notes page for, for this talk. But a few to get started with. Um, Learn You a Haskell for Great Good um, is a uh, book that I read sort of relatively early in this process. And um, it was sort of friendly and approachable enough that I, it, it sort of gave me some of the tools I needed to actually be able to get things done in Haskell. Um, as you get deeper into things, Hoogle um, is a search engine for Haskell libraries. Um, it, it will do this thing where you give it a, a, a type signature for a function, and it will find all of the functions in Haskell, Haskell libraries that it knows about that match that type signature, which is kind of awesome. So like, if I didn't know how to filter, filter things out of a list, I could say, all right, what functions do you have that take a list and a predicate function uh, and return another list? And it would tell me all of them, and one of them, lo and behold, would be filter. I think it's filter. Uh, 
I can Google it if I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> um, there's also a kind of fantastic Haskell wiki. Um, and there's also, I've only heard about this in the last few days, but there's a group called Haskell Now. They have a uh, IRC channel, not Haskell, on Freenode um, that's sort of making various efforts to be a friendly and approachable place to find stuff out about Haskell. Um, I've, I've been hanging out a little bit, um, though uh, not saying anything because I have this sort of social anxiety that does not make me a very friendly IRC person um, in, in both not Haskell and Haskell, um, which contradictory as it is, um, is a good place to, uh, are both good places to learn some stuff. Um, and yeah, I can probably dig up a few more links and put them, put them online later today. Um, and finally, sort of, uh, advice to remember as, as you dig into this stuff more, work tiny, solve one problem at a time, uh, don't be afraid to ask for help, peer programming is fantastic for this stuff, um, try to get continuous feedback, um, so know right away if something is working rather than a few hours later, and take time to stop and reflect. Uh, that's all I got. Uh, that's where to find me. Uh, I think we have like 10 minutes left. So I'd love to take questions, sure. Uh, so I see one there and one there. Uh, it was the question, are, are there any games I found written in Haskell that I looked at? Um, not that I looked at very closely. Um, I. I did a little bit of Googling, and it looks like there are some cool things written in Haskell out there, um, but I, I haven't had a chance to play with them much. <laughs> uh, it's remarkably positive. Uh, uh, I like to use a framework, though. Do you have any, like, little jobs you can Oh, gosh. Um, so, um... Let's see. Um, so I have, I, I would say I have one, I, I have at least one, here's something to look out for that is not better at all in Haskell um, <laughs> story, which is um, at least in GHC, which is the most common Haskell implementation, and it's fantastic. Um, the error messages um, that it gives you when your code is wrong are just, utterly baffling and like incomprehensible. Um, so I, a lesson that I learned fairly early on is like if I had a typo in my code and I ran the compiler and it told me something was wrong, I stopped even trying to read the message. I would just look at um, the like line number and column number where it said the problem was and try to figure out what, what looked wrong there. And then maybe like jump back to see if it would give me some help. Uh, I, I think the, I gathered that this has been getting better over time, um, although I've been doing this for three or four months, so what do I know? Um, but so that's one thing to look out for. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I, should probably, I should probably write some of those down while I'm still at the point where they feel terrible to me. Because like, I can already see my mind sort of bending to the point where I see those things and they make some sense. Um, I think I saw a question there. <laughs> right. Um, I think I saw a question there, a question there, and a question there. Um, so... Oh, cool.
Cool. So, so honestly, at the stage where I was with Haskell when doing most of these, um, I like there was very little room for invention. So, like, they, you know, I, I am an at sign; I can walk around on a screen. Um, and the the sort of first couple um, of sort of so so robot finds kitten is basically I lifted from from Leonard. Um, Actually, Robot Finds Kitten is a fantastic game to start implementing if you want just like a programming problem to do somewhere, um, because um, it also has an incredibly detailed spec. <laughs> uh, so it's a great like toy problem to start with. Um, and Ork and the Ork and the Pie is sort of starting to get a little bit kind of here is an idea from somewhere else. I'm going to try doing it as a roguelike and. We'll see if I sort of press on and start getting more interesting and creative as I get sort of the confidence to support it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Amy Hanlon, is that you? <laughs> Do you mind if I single you out for just a second? I, 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 Amy also had a great blog post a month or so ago about um, basically putting together lists of little programming problems to work on for exercise in kind of the kind of more like on the, uh, over on the somewhat less mathy side. Um, that is, uh, I feel like, a nice compliment to uh, the Project Oily stuff. So <laughs> um, I will try to get a link to that up also. <laughs> uh, and also, yes, Project Oily is fantastic stuff. What's that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think we're at 43 and a half minutes. Uh, so, thank you. So much for the thank you. <laughs>